Hello, I'm Mally Schatzfeld, Managing Editor of Endodontic Practice US, a Medmark publication. Welcome to an educational presentation and question and answer with Dr. Shafiq Safi. In our webinar today, we will be discussing the latest generation of technologies that integrate all variables essential for predictable endodontic success. Before we get started, I'd like to invite viewers to use the question and answer to ask any questions, and they will be answered at the end of the session as time permits. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker. Dr. Shafiq Safi completed his postgraduate residency in endodontics at the University of Pennsylvania in 2015, where he also completed a Master of Science in Oral Biology, researching the outcome of endodontic microsurgery and factors affecting prognosis. Dr. Safi is a, pre a published researcher and lectures on various endodontic topics. He is certified by the American Board of Endodontics. Dr. Safi rem remains on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania's Department of Endodontics, as well as University of Montreal as an adjunct professor. He's also a fa faculty lecturer for Next Level Endodontics. He founded, he founded Sanspa Endodontic St. Laurent in Montreal, Canada, where he lives and practices since 2016. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Safi. And now we turn the webinar over to you to learn more about our topic for today. Thank you very much, Mali, for the introduction. Um, it's my pleasure and my honor to be present with you here today. Um, thank you also for Endodontic Practice and Brassler USA for uh, making this event uh, happen today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my, it's my honor to be here today in order to share with you a topic that is very uh, important for all of us clinicians and is very pertinent today in the world of dentistry that we are living in, which is anatomically driven endodontics. Like Mali said, my name is Shafiq Safi, and at the end of the presentation, you'll have my contact information. Should you have additional questions that come after this presentation, I'll be more than happy to answer them via email. Before we jump and before we start to dig into anatomically driven endodontics, it's very important to start at something that is very important and very uh, basic to us, which is our goal in endodontics, our goal as endodontists or as general practitioner that are doing a root canal treatment. And in endodontics, what we are uh, doing or our goal is to fight or to prevent the development of our endodontic disease. Our endodontic disease is called apical periodontitis, which is these radiolucent areas that we see on the x-rays around the root apices of the teeth. In order to prevent and treat apical periodontitis, we need to exert microbial control, or we need to reach a stage where we are controlling the advancements and the attack and the colonization of the microbes inside the root canal system. And we need to do this very carefully in order to preserve dentin. In other words, in order to also save the tooth and leave it functional inside the mouth of the patient. Because microbial control also can consist in extracting the tooth, right? If we extract the tooth, the microbes are controlled, there's no more disease. So we need to remove the microbes that are, are the source of the disease, but we need to also conserve the dentin so that the tooth is still strong and can function at the long run and offer service for the patient. And this is what we call anatomical microbial control, which is the title of our course today. In order to reach microbial control, we rely on the pillars of endodontics, which are instrumentation, irrigation, and obturation. And if we do these steps according to a certain protocol, if we follow a certain standardized, if you see a step-by-step -step recipe, if you want, we could reach an adequate microbial control and see healing or disappearance of the disease on the x-rays and re-establishment of the natural anatomy, as we see on these two x-rays here on the left side and on the right side, even though sometimes the radiolucent area is in an uh, unorthodox, if you want, place, like in the smaller that was in between the roots, we can, with our instrumentation, irrigation, or alteration, heal this disease if we can really know how to produce or how to uh, execute these three steps according to a certain protocol. However, things are not that easy in endodontics, and I'm sure that many of you 
have heard about the challenges and about, if you want, uh, the issues that one might encounter during endodontic treatment. Notably, and to start with, it's the anatomy of the root canal system. Uh, Walter Hess in 1925 was one of the first researchers that was able to document the extensive and the complicated anatomy of root canal systems. What he found is that the canals are not straight or round like we tend to see on the x-rays. Rather, it's an intricate, complex, a very developed anatomy with a lot of um, connections between canals, a lot of isthmuses, a lot of anastomoses. Uh, sometimes the canals that we see in the smaller open in, a, in the form of a funnel. So it's very uh, hard to be able to uh, imagine this on the x-ray, but this is the kind of anatomy we are dealing with. And this anatomy, when it is infected or when the bacteria are already inside the root canal system, this anatomy becomes colonialized with biofilm, which is a very ordered structure of bacteria or of community of bacteria that hang with each other hand by hand and stick to the root canal walls. And so it becomes an issue for us to be able to reach these non-round areas or these non-round canals in order to be able to scrub and to scrape and to detach this biofilm in order to reach microbial control like we will see in the next couple of slides. So today with our traditional instrumentation techniques, and when I mean traditional, I mean a traditional round file, it doesn't matter what kind of, uh, or what brand of file that you use, they will all drill a round form inside the canal. In other words, if you have a oval canal, like we see on this uh, slice on the, on the slide, you will be able, the best of you will be able to reach a maximal safe size, meaning you're drilling a round hole at the center of the canal, trying to encompass as much as possible of the root canal anatomy, but without destroying the natural anatomy of the tooth. Nevertheless, by doing so, we cannot reach some areas of the canal as we see the white areas here and the white area there. And so even if we try to aim at the maximal safe size, we are not doing this in an anatomical fashion, and we are leaving behind some areas that are not touched or cleaned at all. And this is what we see in a lot of histological slices, and this is what I call non-anatomical instrumentation. And this non-anatomical instrumentation can yield an area about 35 to 40% of untouched or uninstrumented or uncleaned areas, which can harbor bacteria, biofilm, or necrotic tissue, which down the line can lead to an endodontic failure or to post-treatment apical disease, like we like to call it more professionally. Furthermore, the challenges that we encounter with our traditional instrumentation techniques is that there's a lot of torque, a lot of stress that is created against the root canal walls while doing root canal treatment with these round files. In this study by Zadik in 2008, he found that about 9% of, of endodontically extracted teeth were uh, caused by a fracture in the root canal system, as we can see here. And so upon uh, opening the teeth and seeing what's happening, he would see, for example, that there's a, a, a root fracture going all the way through uh, one of the roots. And this will, of course, force us to extract the tooth. We know today that traditional files can tend to create a lot of torque and a lot of stress on the root canal walls. Hence, this is a challenge to us today to be able to clean, not only to clean, but also to clean safely without causing too much damage and causing the thinning of the root canal walls. And so if we want to save or teeth without destroying them, or if you want to try to find a solution for these uh, three issues that I told you today uh, about, which is the complicated anatomy, the biofilm structure of the bacteria, and that traditional round file tend to weaken teeth, we need to kind of shift our uh, thinking and shift the way that we have been thought endodontics for the longest time, where we need to go from a rotary instrumentation 
whereby we are reaching a maximal size to a conformative instrumentation, meaning we have to develop, if you want, a technique whereby we have some instruments or some files that will change their conformation in order to adapt to the irregular shape of the canal and be able to reach all these areas that have not been reached before by the round files. This is in terms of instrumentation. Now with obturation, we also encounter a couple of challenges. Notably that a lot of traditional sealers that are based out of, let's say, calcium hydroxide or zinc oxide eugenol or resin or epoxy sealers tend to shrink upon uh, polymerization and tend also to be washed away. And furthermore, there's no bond between the sealer and the gutta percha, all that eventually leading to microbial leakage. And of course, the lack of seal itself of the root canal system. And this is so, if you want, flagrant in the studies that some studies, they uh, say that there's even no benefit in sealing the root canal system using traditional sealers, no matter what technique that you are using, whether it's thermoplastic, uh, warm vertical condensation, or cold lateral condensation. That's because there's no bond in between the three structures between the dentin and the sealer and the gutta percha. Like we see in this picture here by Ostevik in 2005, we have the dentin here, we have the sealer layer in the middle, and we have the gutta percha on the most left-hand side. And all these three entities are separate from each other, as we can see by the presence of various cracks and various separations between them. And if we dig deeper, if we look more zoomed into this histological picture, what we can see is that we have the gutta percha on the left side, the sealer in the middle, and then the dentin here. And there's a big gap between the sealer and the dentin. There's no seal at all. And even between the gutta percha and the sealer itself. So there's not a real, if you want, combination, or there's not a, a monoblock, or there's no uh, effect of sealing the root canal system with these uh, old traditional techniques and old traditional um, uh, instruments. All this eventually leading to bacterial proliferation, leakage, microbial infiltration, and post-treatment apical disease. Furthermore, many studies have, if you want, uh, proven that some of the compounds that are uh, uh, essential in making those sealers based off zinc oxide eugenol or epoxy sealers can be cytotoxic and even mutagenic, meaning they can cause a certain risk in uh, uh, cancer. And with our uh, 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 obsession in producing a very dense condensation and pushing this agara percha all the way down to the apical third in order to uh, compensate for the shrinkage of the sealer, we were taught to taper a bit our preparations in order to fit our plugger. And if we taper our preparation, then we are removing more dentin than we are supposed to do. And this eventually leads to the thinning of our tooth and, of course, the creation of microfractures like we see on this picture here. And so what is the solution to our dilemma here? What is the solution that one can say we can have or we can offer in order to help us solve the challenges encountered during instrumentation and during obturation? And the solution is to have a three-dimensional cleaning and filling technique whereby we have an instrument that spans all the anatomy of the root canal system. And we have a technique to seal and fill the root canal system that will also adapt to the original anatomy of this root canal system, which is what we call anatomical endodontics. If we look back into history, back in the 70s, when, if you want, endodontics was starting to get more and more a popular, especially with the development of new techniques and obturation, such as warm vertical condensation by the famous Herb Schilder. Well, that same Herb Schilder is, if you want, the godfather of anatomical cleaning. But he was so busy in developing a, a warm vertical condensation that um, his idea that he called the envelope of motion of a file got forgotten by himself, but we can still see some of the pictures of his 
uh, original work whereby he describes how an, uh, an ideal file should work. And he says that the file should expand or the file should, if you want, uh, get a bit of, of, of a volume inside the root canal system and adapt itself to the anatomy of the tooth rather than let, uh, let the, the tooth be adapted to the anatomy of the file. And this is in the 70s. And this idea, for some reason, got forgotten up until, if you want, the uh, early uh, 2000s. In the early 2000s, 2005, I think, um, a lot of the ideas of a three-dimensional cleaning came back into the anodontic world. And if you take today a survey of 3D cleaning files, uh, we have the first, if you want, file system that appeared on the market, which is the self-adjusting file, which is the SAF. And we have the true shape and we have the latest generation, which is the XP3D shaper and the XP3D finisher. And this is, if you want, what we will be talking mostly about during the remaining of our uh, discussion. However, just to give it some credit, I would like just to spend a bit of time on this self-adjusting file, which has been proven to be able to clean uh, the root canal system very uh, conservatively, respecting the initial anatomy and very predictably as well. However, it was a bit complicated to use because it uh, came with a handpiece, there was sodium hypochlorite that used to be expressed via the handpiece, and this was not very, if you want, user-friendly. The handpiece would corrode, and it would take a lot of time. However, uh, it was very uh, 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 efficient at uh, the brightment. It was very efficient at uh, treating all the canals and producing, yielding a clean canal and reaching microbial control. However, due to some uh, technicalities, it did not gain a lot of uh, uh, popularity and is today event, uh, sadly is not used uh, in the market in our orthodontic field. And in 2016, um, based on this uh, desire to uh, help us find a solution for non-anatomical instrumentation, uh, Brassler USA introduced the XP3D shaper which we see in the picture here on the left-hand side. As we can see, it has no conventional flutes. It's a snake-shaped wire. It's not a straight wire. At rest, the wire or the file is at a size 30 and at a taper of 1%. And the file is made of a special alloy called max wire, which infers or which gives the possibility to the file to adapt itself to the anatomy of the root canal system, which what we call adaptive core technology. And will be and this file will be able then to, if you want, uh, expand up to a certain size, which would be ideally a 3004, as we can see on this slide here. And this is based on the changes and the confirmation of the NITI crystalline structure. This max wire alloy, was able to shift from the M phase at room temperature to the A phase at body or at the tooth temperature, which is at 35 degrees. And it's this memorized shape at the A phase that was able to expand inside the root canal system and go and clean all the surroundings and all the intricacies and the irregular shapes and forms that are not reachable in any uh, a safe limit with our traditional round file. If we look at how this file was engineered, uh, one can say or one can see that the tip here is uh, a number 30 at rest. The metal core is at 1%. And we can have an expansion of that core that could reach up to a 4% taper, which we will see according to what protocol we can clean, we can do this. And this offers a minimal invasive shaping and efficient cleaning. And the biggest advantage, if you want, is that this file, thanks to its max wire alloy, can adapt itself to the original shape of the canal. And by doing so, can reach all the areas that are 
not reachable otherwise. Of course, if there is space for it to expand. If a canal is not as wide as another canal, this file is not going to expand if there's no room for it to expand. In other words, it will really respect the original anatomy of the canal. Now, with time, there was a new generation of XP3D Shaper that got introduced into the market as of this year called the XP3D Shaper Plus. And the XP3D Shaper Plus is different in terms of the alloy in, and it's always at a size 30 and a 4% taper. It does not need to shift from the uh, cold uh, room temperature phase to the uh, body temperature phase. And this is due to some technological advancements that uh, engineers have made that really help the clinician to avoid, if you want, the, uh, the, 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 the worrisome or the cumbersomeness of having the file placed at body temperature for it to be able to expand. This XP3D Shaper Plus comes in uh, tandem or comes in union with another file, which is the XP3D Scout. And just like the XP3D Scout, just like the name says, this file is a scouting file that will allow us to create a certain path or glide path inside the canal before inserting our XP3D Shaper Plus with the same goal in mind, which is to respect, uh, clean or instrument the canal while respecting the original anatomy and yielding a cleaner or producing a cleaner canal. This file, this XP3D Scout, is a 1504 file. It's heat treated, so it has 47% uh, uh, more uh, resistance to fracture. It is a mechanical glide path to 1504, prevents the XP from deformation, and can be used at 1000 RPM and 1 Newton centimeter, which is, are the same parameters that we are going to use with our XP3D Shaper Plus. So this is the new sequence, if you want, that will allow us to obtain anatomical instrumentation. One very important uh, uh, aspect of the Shaper Plus is the tip of this, uh, of this file, which has six cutting edges and six cutting facets. And this expedites or makes instrumentation much faster. Also, it starts to cut at 0.12 millimeter of a diameter and can reach 0.3 millimeter in just 0.6 millimeters of work in such a way that we can say that it's a one-step instrumentation to go from the initial diameter of the file before we touch it to reach a size ISO 30 thanks to this expeditive a, a, a tip that the XP3D Shaper Plus has. Another advantage of the XP3D Shaper Plus is that unlike traditional files like we see here on the left-hand side, where these files will tend to really push the debris against the root canal wall and plug all the dentinal tubules and plug all the isthmuses, the XP3D Shaper Plus, since has, it has no core, will never be able to produce a lot of torque, a lot of stress, and thus a lot of pressure and pushing and condensing the debris against the root canal walls. Rather, it keeps the debris in suspension and it agitates actually this fluid that's inside the root canal system, which is, for example, your sodium hypochlorite, in order to favor the elimination and to agitate it a bit and to expel all these debris with your irrigation when you're irrigating with your needle inside the canal. And this is clearly seen in some works by Gustavo de Deuce, who is a great uh, researcher and clinician in Brazil. As we can see here on this left-hand side, using the traditional round file, we are able to produce two round holes here and here, but we are packing the debris inside the isthmuses, and then we are not able to clean this isthmus at all. However, with the shaper, we are able to respect the anatomy of the initial canals. As we can see, we did not produce a round canal here nor here. The debris were always in suspension, so they were always evacuated or flushed out. And thus, the uh, isthmus were, isthmuses were not blocked. And so we are able to send our irrigation fluid inside this isthmus and clear it out and then pr thus produce 
a cleaner canal. So this is one of the other big advantages of the XP3D Shaper Plus. The protocol, which is uh, very easy to use with this system, is that, of course, after having uh, uh, anesthetized your patient, a septic field, access cavity is done, identification of the canals, you uh, reach, you, you, you uh, find your working land with your, let's say, your number 10 file or your number 15 file, you confirm it with your x-ray. After that, you could do some glide path with either hand files or with some rotary files up until you are able or you judge that the canal is fit enough or is worked enough in order to be able to fit the 1504 XP3D scout, which is used by giving three light strokes all the way to working length. And then you irrigate the canal in order to flush out all the debris. This XP3D scout is used as a thousand, at a thousand RPM and one Newton centimeter. And these are the same parameters with which we will use the XP3D shaper plus. So once the 1504 has reached working length and you've given it three light strokes, you irrigate, then you take the XP3D shaper plus, you will give it one to three long strokes up until it reaches working length. And once working length is reached, you will give eight additional long strokes all the way to working length in order to give it enough time and enough opportunity to expand. Of course, if there is enough space for it to expand and to be able to clean all the irregular anatomy and complex uh, isthmuses and all this er these areas that are not reachable with our traditional round files. And the XP3D Shaper Plus can be used up to eight canals. All you have to do, of course, is to count how many canals you've used each time. Once it's at eight canals, then you can discard this file. There are many studies out there that evaluated, if you want, the efficiency and the efficacy of the XP3D Shaper Plus. And uh, the results showed that it's the file that is superior to cyclic fatigue, meaning that it takes a lot in order for the metal to be fatigued and for it to break. It has superior flexibility. Uh, the metal or the file is very bendable and it's very flexible. It would go very easily in curved canals. Very importantly, and if you want, the biggest advantage is that it has a high centering ability and the respect of the anatomy of the original canal, meaning that we are not removing unnecessary dentin, we are just removing the canal, the, the dentin that is infected while respecting the canal anatomy, and we are producing a cleaner canal with less debris, less bacteria, and less compaction of uh, bacteria and debris against the isthmuses and the dentinal tubules. This idea of 3D cleaning is reachable with the shaper, but also is complementary, or there's a complementary step, if you want, that is important not to forget, which is the XP3D finisher. The finisher, just like the name uh, implies, is made in order to finish something that should be finished. And the finisher comes in two sizes. It's a file that, if you see here, has a sickle shape at its uh, tip. It comes at a size 25 or as a size 30 at the tip. The size 30 is called the finisher R, R for retreatment, because it will be going to be specially indicated to use in retreatment cases, as I will show you in the next couple of slides. What's important to remember is that the finisher, whether the finisher size 25 or size 30 is a straight file and has no taper. In other words, it cannot cut or it cannot remove that or it cannot expand the apical size of the canal. Rather, the only thing that it will do is that it will scrub or scrape the canal walls in order to remove, dislodge, break, disintegrate all the debris, whether bacterial or necrotic tissue, or stubborn garapercha tags in retreatment cases, put all these elements in suspension inside the canal, and the only thing that will be left to do after that 
is to irrigate all this mixture of, of, of infective elements from the canal out in order to produce a cleaner canal. The uh, uh, metallic structure of the alloy that makes the finisher is the same one as the one that makes the shaper, which is max wire, which then transform itself from the M phase at room temperature to the A phase into the tooth temperature. There is no finisher plus. In other words, just like I told you that the shaper plus is always in the A phase. However, the finisher has to do this transformation once it goes inside the tooth, there's a raise in temperature from let's say 20 or 25 Celsius at room temperature to about 35 degrees Celsius inside the canal, which then confers the ability of this finisher to expand and to act as a whip or to act as a scrubber or as a scraper in order to clean all the remaining elements that are still stubbornly stuck against the root canal system. If you look at these uh, collection of pictures by Dr. Carvalho, based in Brazil, this is a, a central incisor that is sliced, and we're looking at it, and we can see the buccal palatal direction very easily. On the first picture here on the left-hand side, we have a traditional round file. And as we can see, the canal is very wide, and this file is not touching most of the uh, root canal walls. And so if you have, let's say, got a percha tags left against these walls, if it was a retreatment, or maybe you have just biofilm, it's a, just an, an, init an initial root canal treatment, you're going to leave behind a large portion of the tooth untouched. The finisher acts in two ways. It has two active parts or two, if you want, uh, important uh, uh, parts that can clean. The first one is the tip of the canal, which is this thing here. When the body of the file goes, let's say, into a small narrow part, which is in this case, the orifice of the canal, we can see that it's the tip of the file here that will be able to scrub against the root canal wall. So if you're giving it strokes up and down, you are spreading the action of the tip against all the root canal walls. When the tip of the file goes through a small, let's say, uh, a tight uh, space inside the root canal system, it's the body of the file that will be able to uh, expand and act as a scrubber in, all, in order to expand against the root canal walls and scrape and scrub all the root canal system. And so by giving strokes up and down, you are spreading this action of tip body, tip body, tip body of the file scrubbing and scraping and removing the debris in order to produce a cleaner canal. Studies have been done in order to evaluate the efficiency of the cleaning of the XP3D finisher compared to passive ultrasonic irrigation and traditional needle irrigation. And it was shown that the finisher provided significantly better anti-biofilm cleaning, as well as we have a bacterial reduction in the main canal that is superior that the standard needle, the endoactivator, or the uh, PIPS uh, uh, instrument, as well as more efficiency in cleaning bacteria in the dentinal tubules. So in other words, we're able to clean the canal, kill the bacteria, yield a cleaner canal, meaning reach microbial control, while preserving the natural anatomy of what was done before, because this file, the XU3D finisher, cannot remove that thing, cannot make the, the canal bigger. And so let's say after the XP3D Shaper Plus, the Shaper Plus has respected the initial anatomy of the canal, the finisher will come and just, if you want, polish the inside in order to yield a cleaner canal. When is this finisher indicated to be used? It's indicated to be used in four scenarios or in four circumstances. The first one is, let's say for some reason you are still very uh, 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 stuck or you are still very uh, uh, keen with your, uh, to, be, to be using your traditional round files. After finishing your traditional round file instrumentation, you should employ some XP3D finisher action inside the canals in order to really spread its action against all the intricacies and yield a cleaner canal. After the XP3D shaper, of course, 
there's always, always room to get a cleaner canal. In retreatments and in special anatomical cases such as this dense and dente, the best way to clean gutta percha tags and sealer that are stuck inside the root canal system is with the XP3D finisher R. And in this case, like we see here, this uh, x-ray is courtesy of Dr. Uh, Juwani, who I proud myself to have known him during my residency at UPenn and be uh, one of his co-residents. This is a very wide canal and there's no way that we are able to clean it with any traditional round file because there's no such round file that is as big in order to fit inside this canal and clean it. So the best way to clean it is to scrub it very uh, conservatively because we can see that it's not very thick. The dentin is not very thick. And so the x 3 d finisher R is the best uh, 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 tool to employ in these cases. How do we use these uh, uh, files? If you are using the x 3 d finisher at size 25, then you should at least be able to instrument your canal to a size ISO 25. If you're using the XP3D Shaper Plus, this is automatically given because the XP3D Shaper Plus reaches size 30 or 4. And of course, if you're uh, using the XP3D Finisher R, then you should at least be able to, or you should instrument your canal to at least a size 30, or else the XP3D Finisher R, which is a size 30 at the tip, will not fit inside the canal. You flood the canal with your sodium hypochlorite, and you give strokes five to seven millimeter all the way from working lead up and down for about 60 seconds at a thousand RPM and at one Newton centimeter as a torque, meaning it's the same parameters as the XV3D Scout and the XV3D Shaper Plus. And this is a big advantage in the sense that you shouldn't worry about changing the speed or changing the torque settings. And your assistant also should not worry about that you set your motor or your rotary handpiece to the same speed at 1000 RPM and the same torque, which is one Newton centimeter. And of course, after 60 seconds, you flush this canal with your sodium hypochlorite in order to remove all the debris that have been put in suspension and of course yield a cleaner canal. If you, if you come back, if you allow me to come back a bit to the XP3D Shaper Plus, of course, we spoke about its usability in uh, initial root canal treatment, but the shape of this file also reminds me a lot or should remind you a lot about a corkscrew cork or a wine bottle opener. And just like we uh, open a bottle of wine with, with, with a corkscrew, this file will also be able to be used in retreatments because it will wrap itself around gutta percha and pull that gutta percha out, just like we open a bottle of wine, or I usually also compare it to how a fork can wrap around pasta, and this is how exactly the gutta percha will be pulled from the canal. So should you need to do a retreatment on a case, this is the protocol that uh, is recommended to use using the XP3D uh, Shaper Plus and the XP3D Finisher R. After doing access cavity and finding the canals, you can use a small orifice opener in order to create yourself a little well inside the gutta percha. Inside that well, you will uh, insert or you will inject a couple of drops of solvent in order to soften a bit the gutta percha. After that, you will estimate the working length on your x-ray and you will employ the XP3D Shaper Plus at 2500 RPM. It's very important to use 2500 RPM in order to avoid the XP3D Shaper in binding and uh, not able to rotate and cut against the gutta percha. So the speed is very important or else your uh, torque will, will have to uh, uh, stop the uh, Shaper from rotating. So if you increase the speed, the gutta percha is going to go around that gutta, uh, the shaper is going to go around that gutta percha to the estimated working length, giving strokes up and down and pulling all that gutta percha out, just like, uh, just like opening a bottle of wine or pulling, uh, like I called it before, uh, pasta around uh, a fork. Once this is done, you will establish your working length with your 15 hand file or and then take an x-ray, of course, to, to, to confirm this. 
followed by 15 strokes with the XU3D Shaper Plus, this time with sodium hypochlorite inside the canal. This here, at this point, we, have, we would have removed most of the gutta percha. Now we are cleaning better all these areas that were not reached initially in, during the root canal treatment and removing whatever uh, remaining gutta percha tags is present. Followed by 30 seconds of sodium hypochlorite with the XP3D finisher R, and then 30 seconds of EDTA in order to remove the smear layer that is generated with all these instruments that we are putting inside the root canal system. This is a very easy protocol for retreatments that will really also simplify your, your protocol and retreatment and make it much more easier to produce a cleaner canal and to get rid of post a treatment apical disease. Now, we spoke about 3D cleaning. This canal that is now three-dimensionally cleaned, we want to three-dimensionally fill it. And to be able to three-dimensionally fill it, we need to base ourselves on some new materials out there, which are called bioceramics. And I'm sure a lot of you here have heard about bioceramics. Bioceramics are ceramics used for repairing and reconstructing damaged tissues. In our case in endodontics, the damaged tissues are the periapical uh, tissues, meaning that if you have a periapical lesion, the PDL and the bone that was destroyed, you want to be able to repair it and reconstruct it when you do a root canal treatment. And bioceramics have been used and employed in medicine in various fields or various, if you want, uh, 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 fields in medicine, such as uh, uh, constructive, reconstructive uh, orthopedics, and eye reconstruction, jaw reconstruction, and, and cranial reconstruction, and recently was introduced in dentistry. The biggest advantage of bioceramics is that when they set, they set and they produce calcium hydroxide, which is antimicrobial, and then they produce hydroxyapatite, which is biocompatible, bioactive, and dimensionally stable. And if you think about these four properties here, these are the four properties that we see in our, prop, in our sealers. This is what we want from our sealer. We want it to be antimicrobial, biocompatible, bioactive, meaning to induce the healing, to initiate the healing process, and to be dimensionally stable. And these bioceramics material, they set in an aqueous environment, meaning they like to be in a moist, humid environment. And there's no more uh, uh, moist or uh, humid environment in this whole world than our oral cavity. The properties of bioceramics have been studied extensively to be hydrophilic, meaning they like to be in humidity. They are stable dimensionally, meaning they don't shrink, they don't wash away. They have an alkaline pH, meaning that they can exert an antimicrobial effect. They are biocompatible, meaning that they are accepted by the human body. They don't cause harm to the human body and they are bioactive. And so these are a lot of interesting properties for us clinicians in order to be able to uh, overcome the challenges that we encounter using our traditional sealers made of uh, epoxy or zinc oxide eugenol. And if you think about the goal of obturation, which is to seal the root canal system, to isolate the preapical tissues from the oral cavity, and to entomb or to bury the residual microorganism, all this in a secure manner, it becomes more and more, uh, if you want, obvious for us that bioceramic materials are the way to go. If, of course, we have today some kind of sealer made of bioceramic. And bioceramic sealers and anodontics today, they exist. Uh, the two main ones, if you want, that have been always used are BioRoot RCS from Septodont and EndoSequence BC Sealer by Brasser USA. And we're going to be talking mainly about the EndoSequence BC Sealer because it has been out there uh, the longest. It's the most studied BC Sealer. And... Uh, it's made of an exclusive pre-mixed bioceramic small particles that uh, uh, give it all the advantages that one needs or one seeks in a uh, bioceramic sealer. So the question is, which is more superior? Can we have a bioceramically based sealer that can make us over or let us or allow us to overcome 
all the issues and challenges from traditional sealers. Without going into the details of each study, because this will take, of course, a lot of time, I'm just going to mention a couple of studies with their results. In 2013, Zhu found that endosequence BC sealer did not shrink, rather that it expanded actually a bit in order to fill the micro voids that we cannot see on the x-ray. So this is a big advantage for us. Another study by Zhang in 2010 showed that endosequence BC sealer is highly biocompatible, meaning that it's easily accepted uh, by the human body and doesn't cause harm to the cells around it when it's, let's say, uh, excreted or extruded outside the root canal system. Chang in 2014 has proven that BC sealer can uh, induce osteoblastic differentiation of the PDL stem cells, meaning that it will send a signal to the stem cells to tell them, hey guys, I'm here, now it's your turn for you to come out and to do your job of differentiating into PDL and reconstructing that damaged tissue that was damaged by the infection when the bacteria were inside the root canal system. And Zhang in 2009 has shown that endosequence BC sealer thanks to its high pH, has a very strong antibacterial activity, and it could last up to seven days, meaning its substantivity is very high. And Nagas in 2011 showed that it has an excellent sealing ability. It seals, it merges with the dentin, and it has a very, very high bond strength. And so it eliminates the gap between the dentin and the sealer. And so we're going to have one, if you want, layer that is bound with each other between the sealer and the dentin without having a gap like we saw in Orshtevik uh, histological uh, uh, picture that I showed you before. Now, one might ask himself, do we need still gutta percha in this process? And yes, gutta percha, of course, is going to be used for two reasons. It's going to be used in order to be a pump or a hydraulic force to spread or to, if you want, uh, send the sealer or coat the sealer everywhere inside the root canal system, like we see in this picture here. And most importantly as well, bioceramically based gutta percha cones, which are gutta percha cones that are embedded and impregnated with bioceramic sealers, are going to create a bond between themselves and, the, and with the bioceramic sealer in order to prevent any, if you want, separation between the two and have one layer between the sealer and the gutta percha. So this new technique in 3D filling of the root canal system is called cold hydraulic condensation. As we can see here in this series of picture, after uh, adapting your cone inside the canal, you inject a little aliquot of the BC sealer. So this is another advantage in terms that it is easily injectable, ready to use. You can then take a sensi paste or a lenticular to spread all the sealer all around at a very low speed for about two or three seconds. Then you seat your gutta percha all the way to working length and you sear off or you cut off the gutta percha part that is sticking out of your uh, orifice. And you do this all over the canals and like this you'll be able to seal well, having in mind that this sealer is able to uh, 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 flow everywhere because it's made of very small particles. These particles are made of bioceramics, which will bind to dentin, which will not resorb, which will are which will be biocompatible. And so we are having a good seal made with bioceramic and a biocompatible non-cytotoxic way, in order to seal this three-dimensionally instrumented canal that we just produced with our XP three D shaper and finisher. If you look at this picture from Orshtevik in 2005, this is how traditional sealers uh, uh, are in the canal. This is how they react in the canal. This is how BC sealer is in the canal at low uh, magnification. And this is how it is at high magnification. We have the dentinal tubules here on the bottom layer. In the middle layer, we have the BC sealer. And on the top layer, we have the gutta percha. Notice how all these layers are together. There is no void. There is no crack. There's a solid bond. And thus, 
there is a solid seal. And that seal is not unsealable. We cannot remove it because bioceramics are stable compounds. They are stable substances. They don't wash away. They don't shrink. They stay there. They're made to stay there, which means that this microbially controlled state that you work so hard to get during your instrumentation protocol will be easily preserved thanks to the bioceramic properties inside bioceramic sealer. So this is another paradigm shift. We went from, if you want, from the file having to drill a hole inside the canal to the canal dictating how the file should act inside the canal itself with the XV3D shaper and finisher. And now we're going to move away from the idea that we have to compensate for the shortcomings or for the weaknesses of the traditional sealers by plugging and heating gutta percha and over instrumenting the or over tapering the canal to fit our plugger to being more conservative and to just have to treat where the disease is and sealing this space easily with the bioceramic sealer. And so we will be able to yield a tool that has an increased resistance to fracture, just as it was also documented by Gunaim in 2011, using conservative instrumentation, yielding a better, cleaner canal with no micro cracks, a stronger tooth that is sealed in a biocompatible fashion with a biocompatible, excuse me, with a biocompatible uh, 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 sealer that is made to stay there to seal in a biocompatible fashion and give us a good seal. If you look at his uh, some clinical pictures, on the left-hand side, we have a picture that Dr. Nasse had sent to me during one of his uh, uh, apical surgeries. We can see that here we have a gutta percha cone that is surrounded by black biofilm. This black biofilm should have been sealer, but that sealer in this case was a traditional sealer. It got washed away with time. If you look at the two uh, columns here on the right-hand side, we can see how bioceramic sealer just spreads everywhere, attaches itself, bonds itself to dentin. And we could appreciate the hydraulic forces that are exerted by the gutta percha to, to like send the sealer everywhere and coat the sealer or coat the canal with the sealer everywhere. And this is the only thing you have to do with the sealer. The beauty of it is that you just have to inject it inside the canal seat your gutta percha cone at the right level and the job is done thanks to the bioceramic properties inside the bioceramic sealer. Does this sealer work clinically? Yes, it does. This is one of the first studies by Chibosky in 2018, even saying that the presence of bioceramic sealer extrusion did not impact success of the root canal treatment. Clinically and histologically, if you have an extrusion of traditional non-bioceramic sealer, you have an accumulation of lymphocytes, B cells, and macrophages, meaning you have a small inflammatory uh, reaction happening here, which can then produce postoperative pain and flare-ups. But with endosequence BC sealer, if you have a bit of an extrusion, you have an, an accumulation or you have osteoblasts and bone regeneration, which really shows that this sealer is very biocompatible, is easily accepted and liked by the human body, and can in some cases favor or promote or expedite and accelerate the healing process of an endodontically treated uh, uh, tooth. These are just some couple of cases that I would like to share with you before we uh, take uh, your uh, questions. This is one of the first cases I was able to do using, using uh, uh, anatomical instrumentation techniques with the shaper, finisher, and BC sealer. One can really appreciate the conservativeness of the canals and how we have yielded a stronger canal, a stronger tooth, a cleaner tooth. This is at the two year follow up with a nice fitted crown like here. We can see how the, uh, uh, the, the, the dentin around the cervical part of the tooth is conserved and this will give the strength for the tooth to be functional for many, many years. This is a case sent to me by Dr. Trope where we can see the presence of a big, large lateral canal associated with a big, large radiolucent area. This lateral canal was easily filled with bioceramic sealer, and this has inferred or has helped this lesion to, to heal at a much faster rate than if it was not 
uh, filled with sealer or cleaned at all with any of the, uh, the techniques that I showed you as shaper and finisher. A very curved case, which is one of my cases here, showing you that with the shaper and finisher, these are very flexible files that can adapt themselves. And even if you have a curved canal, they can easily produce uh, uh, nice uh, results and we can use them safely without having to worry about their possibility of breaking inside the canal. So where are we today or where are we heading and what should we be thinking? We should be thinking about saving the tooth and saving dental structure and respecting the canal anatomy. And to be able to do this today, we have to go from, if you want, uh, rotary instrumentation to conformative instrumentation and this is today possible thanks to the family of the xp3d shaper plus and the xp3d finisher because thanks to these two files we can produce an anatomical preparation that is conservative we do not remove excessive dentin for nothing it is secure it does not screw inside the canal it does not create a lot of stress or a lot of torque and so we have less uh, risk of creating uh, fractures inside the roots and is efficient. It can yield a cleaner canal with less bacteria inside. And if you tell me less bacteria, this for me means, of course, a better result on the long run for our patient. We're also moving to conformity and obturation, meaning we want a sealer that will conform itself to that shape that we just cleaned, a sealer that will not shrink, will be dimensionally stable, biocompatible, and where we can rely on the sealer itself to be able to produce a long-lasting effect, with the gutta percha being a piston or a pump to spread the action of the sealer everywhere. And so today, with modern material and methods, such as the endosequence BC sealer, the family of the XV3D uh, uh, files family, the Shaper Plus and the finisher, we have viable and conservative options in order to produce a cleaner canal, an anatomically clean canal with a big potential to improve our already high success rate in endodontics and possibly become the highest success rate that we could ever get in the next couple of years in our lifetime. With that being said, I would just like to say thank you to the uh, 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 professors and the faculty and the clinicians that have uh, thought me during my three years at Penn, notably Dr. Kim, Dr. Karabuchak, Dr. Trope, Dr. Uh, Joe, Dr. Kratchman, Coley, and Setzer, that thanks to them, I became today the endodontist that I am and the lecturer that I am. And of course, once again, thank you everybody for attending this lecture today. Thank you for endodontic practice and thank you for Blaster USA for uh, 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 making this event happen. If you have any questions, you can email me at any time at shafiq.endo at gmail.com. If you'd like to follow my page on Instagram, it's endo Saint Laurent, where I share a lot of cases, tips, and tricks about endodontics. Thank you all very much. I wish you all a very pleasant day. Thank you so much, Dr. Safi. That was really interesting. We do have um, some questions, but Thank before we get to those, I would like to invite viewers to use the question and answer feature in the control panel on your screen to ask any questions that you have. Our first question um, is how many cases can be done using the XP Shaper Plus? Uh, so uh, the, the, the XP Shaper Plus can be used up to eight canals. So if let's say you have a tooth that has four canals, you can take that shaper, mark on it four canals, re-sterilize it and use it again up to eight canals. Okay, well, uh, do we have to adjust working length on the Shaper Plus string instrumentation? And what about the finisher? So this is a very important question. Um, the working length that you determine, whether with your uh, apex locator or radiographically, is the same working length that you'll be using on your uh, Shaper and on your finisher. However, on the finisher, when you buy it in the pack, it comes with a plastic tube and that plastic tube has millimeter markings so you should measure that shaper before you remove it from the plastic tube because as soon as you remove it it's very temperature sensitive 
it will start to bend like this and take a sickle shape. Now let's say you lose that plastic uh, tube that comes with the finisher. If you lose it, then you can measure the working length on the finisher, but you have to retract one millimeter from the working length that you've determined. So if your working length is 19, for example, you use either 19 millimeters with the plastic tube around the finisher or you use 18 millimeters and you measure it on your ruler. Okay, do these new files break easily? Um, these files have a big advantage, as I uh, mentioned, in the sense that they don't produce a lot of torque because they don't uh, drill a hole inside the tooth. And so they are very resistant to cyclic fatigue, uh, especially if you use them according to the protocol that I showed you. You have to produce a glide path of a, with a 3D scout 1504 with the shaper. And you have to instrument your canal to a minimum size of ISO 25 for the finisher number 25 or ISO 30 for the finisher R. If you follow these steps, it's very, very, very rare that you break these files inside the canal. Does the shaper create stress on the root canal walls while expanding? Um, th there are many studies that, that were done uh, showing the uh, photoelastic uh, tests to show the pressure created against the, uh, the root canal wall while using the shaper as compared to, uh, to a traditional file. And just as I said before, there's not a lot of torque created with the, with the shaper. And so there's no stress at all against the root canal wall. And so we have less uh, breakage and we have less uh, uh, fracture and less possibility to damage the root canal walls. Can we sterilize these new files? Yes, these files, so these files come uh, I forgot to mention in size 25, 21, and 31 millimeters. Of course, according to your case, you select the one, the length that's best for you. These files come in pre-sterilized packages. So when you open them from the pack, they're already sterile and you, you can use them right away. If you have more uh, room to use these files, so let's say you have another couple of usages until you reach your eight canals with your shaper, then you can sterilize the shaper, put it in a sterilization pouch inside your autoclave and reuse it again. Same thing with the, with the finisher. The finisher, you could use it up to six to seven uh, canals and you could sterilize it in between each time, of course. Thank you. Is the Shaper Plus safe to use on severely curved or calcified cases? Uh, both of these files are safe to use in curved or calcified cases. Uh, and actually, when it's when the cases are curved, these files they uh, they are uh, ideal because they're very flexible and they will follow the curve. The only thing that really you have to do is to make sure that you have created a good enough adequate glide path all the way from the first time from the first step when you reach your when you look when you uh, find your working length, all the way to using your fifteen oh four three D scout. Once your 1504 3D Scout reaches working length easily, the remaining part of the 3D, of the 3D Shaper Plus is, is, is done very easily without you having to worry about the curve or not. Does the size of the access cavity matter while using the Shaper Plus? Uh, so so that, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Um, and this is a very important topic today that's debated um, in endodontics, which is the size of the access cavity with all the minimal, minimally invasive endodontic, uh, endodontic concepts that we are hearing. Um, you should produce a access cavity that is big enough for you to find all your canals without leaving any canals behind and big enough in order to be able to insert your files and clean your canals adequately without having your file bind or let's say curve against one canal wall rather than the other. And so I would say that any adequate size uh, access cavity can be used um, without having to do them either larger or, or smaller. It has to be adequate enough for you to find the canal and insert your shaper inside or your finisher as well. 
Is there a danger of increasing the final apical size after using the finisher? Um, the, so the, the, the finisher is, is a straight file and it has no taper. So it's a 0% uh, taper. And so it cannot cut or remove dentin at all. The only way it acts is by really uh, slashing itself or whipping the canal. And so by doing so, it removes the bacteria and the biofilm. And so it cannot change your um, master apical or your, your final apical size at all. How, how biocompatible are bar, bioceramics? Does it represent a danger danger to get a sealer puff? So um, the, the, the uh, bioceramics are very, very, very biocompatible. And um, when you place bioceramics in contact with stem cells, uh, no matter what kind of stem cells they are, uh, they are, they will induce the stem cells to produce the final st cell lineage. So, for example, if you take bioceramic particles, you place them on PDL stem cells. The PDL stem cells will divide into PDL or into, let's say, bone stem cells. The bone stem cells will divide into uh, mature bone. And so, there's uh, no danger at all uh, in in having an extrusion or a small puff of sealer. Um, and if you do so, like I showed in the in the in, the, uh, in one of the articles by Ricucci, there is a a, a prom it kind of promotes the healing to happen a bit faster. It's not it's not recommended to have a puff at all. Let's be let's be clear about it. But should you have one here and there, just like uh, it's a risk that you can encounter with any treatment, you shouldn't worry about it at all. It does not produce any harm, and most importantly, it does not produce as much postoperative pain as a non-bioceramic sealer uh, does. Okay, last question. Can we retreat BC sealer? So this, uh, the retreatability of BC sealer have been debated from the first time that BC sealer was introduced into the market, which is about 2018. So it makes about 15 years now that endosecretous BC sealer has been into the market. And all the opponents of that sealer were always saying, oh, you cannot retreat it. And the uh, the concept of retreatment should be uh, should not be confused with having to retreat it or being able to retreat. If you have a, a sealer that will give you a superior uh, seal ability, a more stable seal in a biocompatible fashion, being able to induce healing, whether it's retreatable or not, you should use that sealer and should you have any failure and have to retreat this case then you deal with this failure after this is the way if you want that every clinician i would say should think um, now a lot of studies have shown that bc sealer is retreatable whether in terms of working length or whether in terms of removing the bc sealer against the root canal wall it is an easily retreatable uh, 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 sealer without having any difficulty. And I think there was a recent study uh, that appeared at the beginning of this year in 2023, saying that it's as easily retreatable as any other conventional um, uh, sealer. So that should not be uh, any uh, worry or any, if you want, uh, uh, a problem to, in order to adapt this uh, sealer and to use it into your clinic. Well, thank you everybody for your questions, but we've run out of time today. If we did not get to your question, we will answer it after the webinar via email. Within one hour, all registrants will be emailed a link to the replay and continuing education quiz to complete for the certificate. Thank you all again for attending and a special thank you to Dr. Shafiq Safi and our sponsor for this webinar, Brashler USA. Thank you and take care out there. Thank you everybody.